This is going to be a high yields review on the commonly tested topics on step one for the MSK skin and connective tissue lectures. We'll start with an axillary nerve injury, which presents as numbness to the lateral forearm. A question may describe a football player who gets tackled while his arm was out. Next is a superior gluteal nerve injury. This is responsible for the Trendelenburg presentation where you lean on the side of the injury and you'd want to give a nerve block in the superior medial quadrant. After this, we'll focus on the muscle contractions and it's actually worth taking the time to know the different bands. For example, Z is only thin filaments, M, is way, M has the thick, H has the thick, and the only one that doesn't change during contraction is the A band does not change during contraction. Also know that the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium, binds to troponin C, causes a conformational change, tropomyosin is released and re reveals the actin myosin binding site so those two can bind and they will stay bound until ATP is present to, to help them uh, disassociate. If you don't have ATP, it's going to stay bound. Uh, and so an example of that is going to be post-mortem where there's no more ATP and that's why you develop rigor mortis. Um, osteoporosis, uh, they like you to know that you have normal laboratory values. Also some medications that can contribute to osteoporosis are prednisone and even PPIs which uh, alter the absorption of calcium. Rheumatoid arthritis, this is when you wake up and you really, your, your joints really hurt a lot. A point about rheumatoid arthritis uh, to know is that the cervical spine is often involved. So you may have a question about intubation where they pull back the neck and then the patient goes into spinal shock. This may be a cervical spine injury because of rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis in the acute setting, you treat that with prednisone or NSAIDs and the chronic setting you'd give DMARDs. Sjogren's is commonly tested because it really um, points out the physiology behind making saliva. With normal saliva, we reabsorb the salt. We want to hold on to the sodium chloride, but we'll throw out the potassium. So if you have an insult to the parotid glands and the saliva is moving too quickly, there'll be more salt in the saliva and less potassium because we didn't have time to work on it. Next topic is Lambert-Eaton syndrome. This can sometimes be a little difficult to differentiate between Lambert-Eaton syndrome and myasthemia gravis. A note about Lambert-Eaton syndrome is that you'll have neuropathy. So you may have altered tendon reflexes. You may have autonomic instabilities like um, uh, sexual dysfunction. That'll be present with Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Next is going to be dermatomyositis which importantly can present, if it presents in an older lady, you need to be ruling out ovarian cancer or something along those lines because dermatomyositis can also be a paraneoplastic condition. Reactive arthritis. This is one of the HLA B27 seronegative spondylarthropathies. Um, with these, you wanna make sure that you have proper chest expansion, which can be limited in, the, in these situations. And reactive arthritis in particular develops usually after some kind of insult like uh, Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, even Chlamydia, um, where you have the presentation of can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree, urethritis, uveitis, and arthritis. Regarding lupus, a point I wanna make here is that complement level is going to be low, and that's because your body is attacking itself, and so it's using up the complement. So remember with lupus, you have a low complement level. Um, sarcoidosis, you have chronic granulomas, so you have more CD4 than CD8 cells. And also with sarcoidosis, um, the macrophages are going to be stimulating the 1-alpha hydroxylase, which, uh, which is responsible for the increased calcium absorption and the, high, and the hypercalcemia presentation. The last one here on the MSK section is scleroderma. There's a diffuse and a limited form. The diffuse has the anti-SCL70s and the anti-TOPO1 antibodies. To review, TOPO isomerase is responsible when the DNA gets too, uh, uh, how would I, uh, it gets too clustered and you wanna release some of the tension. You wanna cut one of those uh, bands. That's done with TOPO1. It cuts one of them, and so it releases some tension. Um, later, it will re-anneal. The, the, the limited form is where you have Crest syndrome. Crest syndrome, um, important to know that you can also have, because you have poor blood flow to your fingertips, you can get fingertip ulcerations, and the lower esophageal sphincter gets atrophied and fibrosis, which is why you have esophageal problems as well. The dermatology section, um, 
The blisters are important to know. Bullis versus Volgaris. Pemphigus Volgaris is vulgar. It's worse. It affects the mucosa. You have Nikolsky sign positive and anti-desmoglein antibodies. Whereas Bullis Pemphigoid, it attacks below by the basement membrane and it's less severe. No mucosal, no Nikolsky sign. The skin cancers are important to know as well. Uh, the first is going to be a basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common. Uh, it'll present grossly as a pink pearly telangiotasia with central ulceration or crusting. These are because you're exposed to too much sun. And these are local, but they don't really metastasize. Um, so that, it's good in that sense. Um, and under microscopy, you'll see the nuclear palisading. Squamous cell carcinomas. Also, because of sun involvement, they begin as actinic keratosis, they progress to squamous cell carcinomas, and they usually involve the lower lip. Microscopy shows keratin pearls. Melanoma, finally, the S100 positive uh, skin kind of cancer, which has the A, B, C, D, E. Remember, 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 depth of invasion is responsible for its metastasis and how bad it is, and so you'd want to cut that out with wide margins. Four important medications here. Start with aspirin which in overdose or toxicity will present with uh, seizures. It can have ear ringing, could even develop to coma with children Ray syndrome. Um, and because aspirin stimulates the respiratory centers in the brain, it'll speed up your ventilation. So you get a respiratory alkalosis. Later you get the metabolic acidosis that you would treat with the bicarb. Next medication is celococcid. This is interesting because it's a reversible selective for COX-2 inhibitor. And so it really highlights the difference between COX-1 and COX-2. COX-1, to review, is responsible for the platelets, protecting platelets, as well as protecting the GI lining. So with a COX-2 inhibitor that's selective, like celococcib, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to still protect your gastric lining, so that's good if someone has gastritis. The downside, though, is that you're not altering your platelets at all, so you're still um, predisposed to, to clots. It could also be used for rheumatoid arthritis. Gout, important to know here, is that in acute gout, you give either NSAIDs or colchene. The MOA of colchene is going to be to stabilize tubules so you can't make microtubules, um, resulting in poor chemotaxis and poor white blood cell degranulation. Um, it could cause one of the bad side effects, though, is the GI upset, nausea, vomiting, which are, which are pretty serious with that medication. In a chronic gout is when you use allopurinol. So just to review, because this is an important point, allopurinol is for the chronic gout. Another use for allopurinol is to prevent tumor lysis syndrome. Um, and in that, also with allopurinol, remember that because it's a xanthine, oxy, xanthine oxidase inhibitor, um, six mercaptor purine and azathioprine, which are normally metabolized by xanthine oxidase, those metabolites are gonna stay at high levels because if you inhibit xanthine oxidase, they won't be metabolized. The biphosphonates, are pyrophosphate analogs. They inhibit the osteoclasts. Important to know that it's the osteoclasts that are inhibited, which is actually why they can be used in Paget's disease, where you have um, too much osteoclast in that first phase of Paget's disease, and it, you know you could get those multinucleated cells with over 100, uh, like huge numbers. Um, and so that's, that's where biphosphonates are working. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, let me know. Thank you.